All right, so I was trying to piece together this big, uh, we had a big melodrama or what looked like an interesting, mel potentially interesting melodrama between Notes from Autumn and Matt Dillahunty. But it wasn't quite clear to me. I watched her video, um, and then I watched uh, The Purple God, Bearded Heretic. I watched his take on it, too. It wasn't quite clear to me. The part about it that I, you know, Bearded Heretic says he's not interested in drama. That's exactly why I was watching, dude. That's why I wanted to see the drama. But uh, it wasn't quite clear to me exactly what went on. There was a lot of talk about the potential altercation, but as far as I can tell, my guess is she was appearing on the line, um, and which is Jimmy's Jimmy's offshoot show, which Matt, maybe the hang-up she was on with Matt Delahunty, don't know. Um, and maybe Matt Delahunty was being too aggressive or too obnoxious with somebody on air, and she called him out on air and said something about it, and he got upset with her. I don't know if that's what happened, because they pulled the videos that she was associated with. Now, if that's what happened, and that's just a guess, so take that with a grain of salt, it might not be what happened. I'm sort of with her in spirit and her critique overall of the tone of Dillahunting atheist experience, and I think Matt Dillahunty has some self-awareness about that. That's why he apologized on Twitter, if you saw last Monday, a couple days ago, he apologized for insulting someone on the atheist experience. Now, what's interesting about this to me is the dilemma it poses for the atheist experience. So I'm probably with Notes from Autumn in spirit, but I also think, and I can't judge this without seeing what, what actually transpired on the video itself, but I also think, like, you know what you're getting into. You know, if you go sign up for a Schwarzenegger movie and you get called to be in a Schwarzenegger film, she's only been an atheist for two years or so, three years or something, and she was getting, you know, basically a, a plum spot and she knew what the brand was getting into it. That's the part that I, I can't judge properly without seeing what actually went down. You know, you get, you, you, you get hired to be in a Schwarzenegger film. You don't show up and go, hey, wait a minute. This movie's only about explosions and pithy lines. Like, yeah, it's a Schwarzenegger film. What would you think you were signing up for? You know, this is a Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> it's, it's the brand. Atheist experience, that's the brand. That brand is debate me, bro. That brand is wreck the Christian. Dunk on the Christian. That's the atheist experience in a nutshell. Now here's the dilemma, and I empathize with you if you're one of the producers of atheist experience, or you sit on the board as apparently Matt Dillahunty does. There's a dilemma going on, and you can tell this just by the surface manifestations. And it's a pretty interesting deep level dilemma. Because his particular brand of atheist experience, his thing, is what makes it popular. It's why people are watching the show, to see Matt Dillahunty dunk on the Christian. It's why it's popular. It's like, you know, she went to McDonald's and said, hey, are we only going to sell junk food? <laughs> yeah, that's the brand, <laughs> you know. So I'm not sure what, what she thought the legitimate complaint was. I'd have to see how it went down and how she handled herself. I, I agree with her in spirit. If she wants to say that that's not the right way that if the approach for atheism to take overall. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, I agree with you, 100%. That's why I'm always championing the philosophical atheists, why they're the exact opposite of that approach, and they probably revile that approach. They don't do that at all. They almost never just, actually, I've never seen them do that. You know, you don't say, I'm a Christian, and they start dunking on you. The guys I always mention, Answers and Reason, Bearded Heretic, Philip Mueller, the Purple Guys, Bearded Heretic, um... They're part of another trend in atheism that I call the philosophical atheists. Now, the beauty of the philosophical atheists is those guys are set no matter what. Their brand is entirely different. What they are about is they're very, very interested in philosophy of religion and all the conversations to be had around that. Okay, They don't dunk on Christians for no reason. They just don't happen to believe in God. So they start growing in influence in the atheist community, which is what I've foreseen. I foresee the tension between them and the debate me bros ending only in their favor. And this, this new rupture with Matt Dillahunty is evidence, exhibit A, in favor of that conclusion. Because their brand, once formed, so let's say Answers and Reason gets, whatever, 120,000 subscribers or so, he will keep that 120,000 subscribers from now until the end of time. Till Jesus comes in the flesh. And says, See, here I am. Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. Oops. You know, he will keep that 120,000 subscribers the whole way through. Why? Because their brand has sustainability for the long term. There are always going to be people interested in philosophy of religion. There are always going to be people who don't believe in God. 
So their brand is set no matter what happens with atheist proper, no matter what happens with the Four Horsemen, no matter how popular atheism becomes as a movement in the culture at large, they're set, period. They are sustainable. Their model is sustainable long term. The Matt Dillahunty model, okay, why there's a dilemma in the atheist experience, why there's a lot of hand wringing, and I'm just guessing based off of the surface manifestations. First of all, they hired Shannon. Shannon is very off-brand for the atheist experience. So is Jenna Belk. So is Vila Bianca. So there is some awareness there. Those three are way more like the philosophical atheists. Behavior-wise, they're the philosophical atheists. Jenna Belk is nice. Um, I interact with Twitter a lot. It's basically nice. Or, no, v, v La Bianca is really nice. And Jenna Belk, I've interacted with her once um, in public. She struck me as very Shannon-esque. Okay, when they hired Shannon to be on the atheist experience, that's basically an admission that this brand of atheism, we are trying to change course correct to some degree. She, I, I don't know who was responsible for hiring her. It could have been Matt Dillahunty himself. But that's basically, we get it, this type of, you know, atheist experience where the Christian calls up and you duck on him is tenable for the long term. The only possible person, what I was saying praise of Matt Dillahunty, this is going to strike you as odd, but I swear to God this is true, this is really good insight, he is the only possible person who could have made that type of atheism successful. That's what the brand was of Atheist Experience. You watch the show, the Christian calls up, Matt Dillahunty dumps on the Christian, starts asking him chess questions. Are you telling me with the Old Testament endorsing slavery, and you're telling me that you get your morals from the, and the person gets all rattled, and their head's like, ah! And then he basically hangs up on him. Now they know that that's the brand, that's why they called the offshoot show The Hang Up. So there's some awareness that this is a Schwarzenegger film with cool explosions and pithy one-liners and that's what's putting people in the seats. There is absolutely some awareness in the atheist experience on the board of, of directors or the people who are producing the show. I know this immediately, I'm sure they understand this, that that's what's put making the show popular. His brand of atheism. But there's a lot of rumblings in the atheist community. Why? Because a lot of atheists in the community itself feel that that type of atheism is the problem. Now, you've already had two examples, and I, I'm not saying this is exactly what happened, but it looks to be at least somewhat what happened, Telltale Atheist and Jen Aldrich, who quit the com atheist community in disgust. Now, I'm not saying about Matt Delhunty at all, but I think at least partially some of that disgust was against debate me bro culture and the sort of wrecked the theist, you know, you're a theist, yeah, let's dunk on you. <laughs> It's the reason why the philosophical atheists don't participate in that at all. Why? Because they're not idiots. You know, they're generally smart, intelligent human beings, and they realize that that's a total and complete and utter waste of time. They don't need some sort of fourth grade reinforcement of how intelligent they are by, like, dunking out a nose or a Christian. Oh, look, I wrecked this nose or a Christian. Yo, high five. Now, Matt Dillahunty's intelligent enough to know better, too, but I think he, you know, he kind of rolled with it because it was what was making the show popular. And he is the only one who could have pulled it off. Other than that, any other person who had popularized that type of brand of atheism would have been reviled. Christopher Hitchens was able to do it too and pull it off without being reviled. Same reason. Why? Because when they're not doing it, when Matt Delhunty's on a normal debate, he can be really civilized and decent and come, come across as kind of a cool, civilized human being. So he can do both. There are two Matt Dillons. He's even complained that some people say, hey, wait, this is a different Matt Dillon. He says, there aren't two Matt Dillons. He says, oh, yeah, there are. There's an atheist experience Matt Dillon, who's totally like, you know, destroy the Christian by hook or by crook, just whatever. You know, ask them questions, interrupt them, shut them down, get mad. And then he's actually really skillful. It's what I call street tactics in other videos. He's really skillful at street tactics. He can do it so well that sometimes the person on the other end of the call starts apologizing. I swear to God I've seen this happen. I'm sorry I'm wearing you out, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm trying your patience so much. And he gets, oh my God, and calls him a jackass. It's really entertaining, though. You can say, oh, you know, I'm morally handering about it, but it's really entertaining. It's why I watch the show, too. I swear to God. I swear to God that's true. It's why I watch the show. I almost never watch the show when it's not Matt Delonte. Yeah, it's not my favorite style of atheism either to engage with. And I'm complaining about it all the time. 
But in his hands, it's really entertaining and somewhat skillful. Actually, very skillful. I swear to God, I've seen him get people to apologize for wearing him out, for trying his patience. I've seen that happen more than once, probably once a week. So he's really good at it. And it's the brand. It's what's popular about the 80s experience. It's why people are watching. So there's some dilemma behind, you know, behind the curtains, off stage. We want to switch brands. We want to have more people like Shannon who are conversational. You know, the, the offshoot show shows you that there's awareness about this. The offshoot show was Truth Wanted. Now, that's objectively, Dan, totally different type of experience. He's not a debate me bro. He wants to have conversations with people that are honest. Now, I totally endorse his way of approach to being an atheist. 100% I've even guest hosted the show. Uh, at one point I could say I was the only Christian who has guest hosted from inside the ACA, but now I think three or four people have done it, Truth Wanted. Pretty sure Mrs. Hammurabi, Mrs. Hammurabi you did it once, and then a couple other Christians have guest hosted Truth Wanted. There was a Christian month, and you know, I had to go to New York, so I was invited, but there was some sort of, I'm not exactly sure what happened. I, uh, but prior to, prior to last April, I was the only Christian who had guest hosted from inside the ACA. Now, there's no way they would, that could even work on Atheist Experience. The audience would be like, ah, I can't believe you invited a Christian. Ah! The audience would freak out. Why? Because that's what the audience is paying to see on that particular show. They want to see the person dunk on the Christian. That's what makes it popular. That's what they want to see. In politics, they call it red meat. You know, you, you, you turn on, like, Tucker Carlson because you want to see him dunk on the liberals. You turn on Rachel Maddow, same reason, different paradigm. You want to see her tell you how dumb Ted Cruz is or whatever. It's the same idea. That's what makes that show popular. Anybody less skillful or less charming as a human being, when Matt Dillahunt is in a normal debate, he's, he comes across as civilized and decent. He's even friends with some of the Christians. I think he's pretty good friends with Blake Gunter. I don't know if he's actual friends with Inspiring Philosophy, but it doesn't seem like there's any real acrimony between them. wouldn't surprise me if they're kind of palsy-walsy and call each other up, hey, you want to hang out? <laughs> I don't know, go bowling? No, not really. <laughs> um, so that's what saved the atheist experience from being, you know, you see there are other people who have come in his name Debate me bros out there on Twitter, and as I said, that brand is not tenable in any other hands. Why? Because the people on Twitter who try to act like that, first of all, are idiots. That's important. <laughs> it's really important. Because they're not going to get away with wrecking the Christians. They can't actually wreck the Christians anymore. Because there are Christians who are coming, and there are going to be more coming, who are smarter. See, here's the general trend in atheism in general. And I'm overgeneralizing a little, but not that much. Okay, there were two main selling points to atheist proper. Well, the four horsemen were the people who put atheism on the map as a cultural phenomenon to begin with. And one of the big selling, there's two big selling points. Why they got so many atheists so quickly. People who were fundamentals Christians challenging their faith. That, you know, that Richard Dawkins book was like gold. It was like, here is permission to think freely. Here is permission to think, you know, maybe Jonah didn't live in a whale for three days. Prior to him, you know, your, even your well-intentioned friends were like, shh, don't even think that. You know, don't even think they're going to go to hell for even thinking that. So that's what Fundamentals Christianity was all about. Getting deep inside your brain and putting a boogeyman inside there to make you not question any aspect of your faith at all. Yeah, it's not healthy, it's toxic, just like a lot of the atheists said. There's a certain level to it, it's toxic. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> okay. So this offered somebody permission to think freely. That's what it offered them, you know, if, if I don't have to care about burning in hell, why? Because God probably doesn't even exist. There you go, slam, checkmate. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> See ya, don't want to be here anymore. That's really what it was all about. Some fundamentals Christian looked around age 19 to 20, usually a guy, but it could also be a girl, looked around and said, you know, I don't want to be like these people anymore. I don't identify with this. I don't want to be like this, but I'm afraid of burning in hell. And here comes Richard Dawkins. Oh, cool. I don't have to burn hell. Why? God doesn't even exist. Thank God. Thank God. God <laughs> doesn't even exist. That's a big, huge part of what went down. Now, the second wave of atheism that put people out here on Twitter and YouTube were the Debate Me Bros. And their rationale was totally different. They don't care about philosophy of religion. They don't care about arguments for God. They don't care what's true. They saw Christopher Hitchens and Matt Dillahunty. 
I swear to God, Matt Dillahunty was a huge, huge influence on that particular type of atheist. I've heard them when I've been in debates with them and talked to them and been invited on their channels. I've heard them quote, I've heard them quote him word for word. They didn't know they were quoting him word for word. I did. Why? Because I remember what the, where the quote came from. Quote him word for word. Matt Dillahunty's words out of their mouths, and they were debate me bros. They were the type of atheists that basically everybody reviles. <laughs> the only one who gets away with it is Matt Dillahunty. Why? Because he has some charm. But that's the second wave of atheists. People saw Christopher Hitchens or Matt Dillahunty wreck somebody in a debate and said, that's what I want to do, man. I want to show how smart I want to wreck somebody in a debate. That's the second wave, the debate me bros. Those guys are not long for the space. When I say there's tension between them and the philosophical atheists, I mean that. Philosophical atheists, as I mentioned, Philip Mueller, Answers from Reason, the purple guy, Bearded Heretic, and there's a bunch of others who I mentioned. Those guys are ultimately going to triumph. It only ends in favor of the philosophical atheists, why their brand has staying power. They're honest actors. They aren't here just to dunk on Christians. They're kind of embarrassed by the type of atheist that is. That tension only grows and it only ends in favor of the philosophical atheist. Now, if you're a general atheist, um, Bearded Heretic, if you're listening, there are people who are could be one of you really easily. Shannon is the one I always point to. Behavior-wise, she's like you. John Steingrad is very similar to you guys. He's starting to th think about philosophy of mind. He's maybe a panpsychist. Now, one day, maybe he's a, an idealist. He's exploring. He's more open-minded. He's more philosophical in nature. There's also a lot of agnostics. Majesty of Reason comes to mind. Micah. There's a lot more of these type of guys floating out around here than you realize. It's just that debate me bro culture kind of dominates because that's how most people's experience of atheism is. Which leads me to the obvious. If you are an atheist listening to this, trust me, this is really good insight. Side with the philosophical atheists. Vote for them. <laughs> how do you vote for them? Promote their products. Adopt their methodology. Adopt their ways. Why they have staying power and it's your best interest to do so. Think of it this way. A lot of you don't even know who Graham Oppie is. I see that on Twitter. Atheists don't even know who he is. Blows my mind. I know who he is, and I've, you know, I haven't quite read his books, but I've watched a lot of his debates. Okay. If you don't know who Graham Oppie is, if you're an atheist, you should. But the point is, is he is, there is nobody who doesn't respect Graham Oppie. He interacts with Christians all the time. He does debates with people like Edward Fazer, high-level philosophical debates. Behavior-wise, he's basically impeccable. But, you know, intellect-wise, his credentials are excellent. The point is he is completely well-respected by everybody who interacts with him. I have never heard any Christian, anybody, have anything bad to say about him. If you are an atheist, think about this. This is really, really, really good wisdom. It is in your best interest. It is far, far, far in your best interest to have a smaller community that everybody respects that everybody has nothing but positive things to say about than a bigger community that people revile. Promise. I promise that's true. Matt Dillahunty is the only one who could pull off debate me bro and not be reviled. He's not reviled. People are starting to get mad at him now and he's starting to apologize for some of his behavior, but I don't expect that to, to, to last very long. Why? His type of atheism is popular, but he's the only one who can pull it off. He's the only one with enough charm. He's not exactly Cary Grant, but he's close enough. He's not exactly Shannon, but he's close enough to Shannon-esque when he is not being an atheist experience, you know, hang up on the guy, rah, shut you down, rah. When he's not doing, oh my, oh my God. <laughs> I've said that three times an episode. Oh my God. The guy's wearing me out so much. You jackass. <laughs> I swear it's entertaining. I swear that's why I watch it. That his particular version of that is probably not going anywhere. Why? Because it's popular. I can quote him. I think it's fun. <laughs> you know, I watch it to be entertained. I swear to God, a lot of people are watching it just to be entertained. It's entertaining. It ain't going anywhere, or I don't foresee it going anywhere. It's like complaining about Trump's behavior. You could try. <laughs> Everyone complained about Trump's behavior a lot, right? Okay, yeah. But people noticed that it was sometimes counterproductive to the interests of the Republican Party in general. Correct? Correct. Then sometimes Republicans go, oh man, this is really hurting our brand. Yeah, yeah, okay. Did Trump ever do anything about it? No. Why? Because it served him. I don't for maybe Matt Dillahunty will, will, will calm down and become the civilized debating Matt Dillahunty who shows up at debates. It's possible. 
but I'm not betting on it. Why? Because his atheist experience persona is popular. It's why people, you know, watch atheist experience. And the dilemma behind the scenes, I promise you this is some of it, is we, we have to sort of shift brands if we want to stick around. But how, how do we do it? You know, and there's, there's confusion there. There's cacophony there. They hired three people. Vila, Bianca, Jenna Belk, and Shannon in particular. And I guess notes from Autumn is probably more. She probably admires Shannon. She probably wants to be more like Shannon, which I got. She's been on my channel. You know, she was, she was cool when she was on my channel. So my guess is she wants to model herself more after Shannon civilized interactions who basically people respect too. That's totally off-brand from Atheist Experience. You know, somebody calls up Atheist Experience, Shannon wants to have a conversation with you. I don't even, I don't know if they pressure her to not be like that. I don't know how that gets resolved. Why? Because it's off-brand. The rest of the people are watching Atheist Experience because they want to see Matt Dillon deep dunk on the Christian. And there's nobody else who's even coming up the pike who can do it. I don't see anybody else in the community who could do it as successfully as Matt Dillahunty. You know, the people out there who are the debate me bros, the problem with them is they're all idiots. I swear to God, they're all idiots. They're all pack of idiots. <laughs> they aren't dunking on anybody anytime soon. <laughs> the only reason they survive is they find like a dumber nose our Christian to come on their channel and then they dunk on him. But most of the people who I know, you don't see them doing a lot of interacting with a lot of the new channels that have popped up. Why? Because they can't. You know, guys, guys like Zach, I pointed this out before, London Theist, Zach, uh, I don't know, is Nathan a Christian now? Nathan, <laughs> Nathan's, Nathan's a Christian. You know, the people who, are, who have come up in the last two or three years, Dry Apologist, Spartan Theology, John DePew, you know, there's people who have recently started channels who are Christians. There's really no dunking on them. There's no way that these guys can... can you know, make them look or sound really stupid and foolish. Matt Dillahunty probably could if they called up the Atheist Experience. Outside of that, even Matt Dillahunty probably could. If they call it the Atheist Experience, it's easy. If you if if you if you run the if you run the narrative, when you when somebody is called your show, you have all the power. So it's really easy to make someone look foolish. It's not an accomplishment, just so you know. Now they started another type of show, which was Truth Wanted. I uh, haven't checked the numbers recently. I fully endorse, objectively, Dan, I fully endorse his approach to atheism. I think it's the right approach. And I think ultimately it's the only approach that's going to last. The philosophical atheists have a very similar approach. I think their approach will be around for the long haul, no matter what happens to atheism as a popular movement in the culture at large. That's why it is in your best interest if you are an atheist. Side with the philosophical atheists. You know, I don't know, I don't know who to vote for in this Notes from Autumn, Matt Dillahunty, back and forth. We need more information. I, my, I, my inclination is to lean towards Note from Autumn, but I need to see more of what actually transpired on the videos that took down. You know, um, so I don't, I don't know who to vote for in that. Um, but the general tension is, is there, and what's, that tension is going to exacerbate in the months and years to come doesn't get any better, it only gets, gets more intense. Ultimately, I see it only ending in favor of the philosophical atheists. Phil Mueller thinks I'm being optimistic. I don't think I'm being all that optimistic. I think I don't foresee any other way it goes down. Matt Delonte is the only one who could pull off that style of atheism without people really thinking he's a, he's a total jerk. And I guess some people do think he's a total jerk. But outside of that, you go watch the debate me bro con who's the guys that you always swear off? Like Duke, you know, I don't want to name names because they never tell me any wrong, but like Duke and guys like that. I mean they're they're embarrassing. <laughs> you 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 recognize when you interact with them that they're embarrassing, correct? Okay. <laughs> well, so does everybody else. <laughs> it gives atheism a bad name. And you know, there's a best, if you are an atheist, side with the philosophical atheist. Why? It's in your best interest. You want a smaller community that everybody respects and everybody has nothing but good things to say about. If I were a Christian, calculating in the same way, if there's a bunch of Noah's Ark Christians in this space, getting in everybody's face, telling them they're going to burn in hell, you know, I'd be doing the, I'd be, I'd be exactly like the philosophical atheist. I'd be fighting with them more often than not. As it is, there aren't any. All the names I name, none of them are fundamentalist Christians. None of them are even really close in either spirit or in truth. They're not, you know, as far as I know, I don't even think they're close. So if there were a whole bunch of Noah's Ark fundies here getting in people's faces telling them they were going to burn in hell, and that was a big chunk of the Christian community in this space, I'd be fighting them a lot too. 
be my only agenda, probably. Why? Because I want to, I want to popularize. I want people to see my channel and go, Christians are normal people. And that's kind of what the philosophical atheists want. They want, you know, they want atheism that represents them. And how I see them is they're honest actors who are interested in philosophy of religion and they happen to not believe in God. And I, I see that as being tenable for the long term, no matter what happens to atheism in the culture at large, as a popular movement. As a, as a popular movement in the culture at large, I see it kind of struggling past this initial wave. Uh, the initial wave was the Four Horsemen. Why? I've been to, to New York. I've been back to real world. There are no storefronts for atheism out there in the real world. None. I was really surprised, actually. None. And uh, the places where I go, where I go when I go back home, back east, are the places where atheism would be. Secular land, Westchester County, New York City. That's, you know, the people I know are the type of people who would become atheists. They are almost all nons. They don't believe in God, but they aren't atheists. And more importantly, they don't seem to be interested in atheism at all. At all. So, that tells me something about, you know, atheism as a mass movement in the popular culture. How far that appeal goes, I don't know. People will deconstruct from religion, yeah, that's a given. But at the same time, people are also migrating online in more and more numbers faster than they are deconstructing from religion. So 15 years from now, yeah, there'll be, what, 45% of the population will be Christian as opposed to 50 or something like that. But almost all those people have migrated online, which means there's going to be a lot more Christians in the space, a lot more. There are a lot more Christians out there in the real America than there are online. They dramatically outnumber, if you're in the Bible Belt, they dramatically outnumber you in the real world, correct? They don't where I live. I live in California, I live in New York. California and New York may to some degree be the future, but that future is 50 years off. Before that happens, the Bible Belt and every, every other part of America is going to migrate completely online. Why? Because that's a trend that's coming. That's how this world is going. That's what's happening. And that will happen sooner than people deconstruct from Christianity. So I see that being a struggle for atheism to maintain a level of growth. Um, part of it is just, you know, it's part of it is just common sense. A big part of the market for atheism, and you, you could disagree with this, this is just me talking off the top of my head, but a big part of the market for atheists proper okay, was the, was the fundamentals Christian who was questioning his faith. Richard Dawkins and those guys, that's like, you know, catnip to them. It's giving you permission to think freely, permission to question. I don't, I don't have to care if I believe that Jonah was in a whale for three days. Why? Because God doesn't even exist. doesn't matter if I'm going, you know, I, there's no hell to go to. So that's the real growth market. But those people deconstructed generally it was a process from deconstruction to deconversion, from questioning the faith to becoming an atheist is a process. Normally that process took a couple years. There are a lot of other stopping off places along the way now than there used to be 10, 15 years ago. There's a lot of places you can stop that isn't quite atheism. And I see it being a lot of those. You know, the people like Joe Schmidt or John Verveke who are agnostics, who are really interested in spirituality, I see that being a real growth in the years to come. I see that being the biggest potential market. Now, the philosophical atheists can, can make a lot of their natural compadres with those. They, they, they naturally, that's a natural fit for them. But the actual, you know, debate me bros, the, the, the content creator, like all Christianity is fundamentals, Christianity, that's not a natural fit. It's not. They seem just as disinterested in intelligent agnosticism as they, you know, in understanding spirituality or thinking about spiritual in any way that's like intelligent and nuanced and exploring it. You know, you don't have to believe in a faith to explore it in a way that's intelligent. You really don't. And there's plenty of like spiritual agnostic types who, when they talk like John Verveke, they sound almost like Christian mystics. You know, they just happen to be agnostic. I see that being the real growth market. That's what a lot of people are going to be interested in. And that's sort of a Jordan Peterson-esque take on religion. It can even be Christianity proper, just a lot toned down. So that it doesn't even seem like fundamentals Christianity. That's where I see growth. Right? People really be interested. That speaks to people. That's got something to say. That's what people are going to be really interested in. 
I think John Verbeke was, uh, or uh, Jordan Peterson, the response to Jordan Peterson said that to me. You know, he got like a million and a half followers almost overnight. That's more than the Aces experience, mind you, a lot more. Because that, there's a hunger for what he represents. Whether you think he's right or wrong, or whatever you think about him, just what he represented in terms of being somewhat on the side of God belief or spiritual belief, but not quite convinced about the metaphysical commitments, but sympathetic overall, I think there's a real growth for that. That's kind of a spiritual agnostic, someone who doesn't necessarily believe in the metaphysics, doesn't believe, you know, the Bible is literally true, but understands the, spirit, the, the importance of spirituality. You can even be a humanist, and that, that, that market is there, and that market is there to be grown. You can be a Christian and exploit that market. You can be a philosophical atheist and tap into that market. That's where I see the real growth coming from. I could be wrong, but I really honestly don't think so. I see that's the, that's the natural approach. Once you become an atheist, there's, there tends to be a tendency. Your first, John Verveke had the same tendency. His first couple of years, he was militant. A militant atheist, you know, debate me, bro. You, you, you got to have a sky fairy all, all over the place. Then he eventually calmed down and started just getting interested in philosophy of religion. That's how I see the natural trend. You know, once you stop being defensive about being a, not a fundamentalist, and you stop seeing all types of religion as basically leading right back to fundamentals. It's not a gateway drug, guys. Religion is not a gateway drug. It's not like you try, you know, Taoism and all of a sudden you're a fundamentalist again. It doesn't work like that. You try Taoism and you can accept or reject any given thing that you find philosophically interesting or useful along the way. You can even do that with Christianity. The only difference is fundamentalist Christians d discourage that. They call it cafeteria Christianity, but it's really easy to do. You can even go to a church and do it a little. Well, I believe this and I don't believe that. <laughs> I'll take some of this, some of that. You know, they discourage that's cafeteria of Christianity. Yeah, but it's also kind of a natural way that humans are going to interact with religion altogether. Sure, it's cafeteria of Christianity, but it's also kind of normal. You know, I mean, I became a Christian when I was 29 years old. I was sort of doing, you know, what, what they believe at the church that I first attended about anyone's standalone idea of Christian Christian I'm not even sure do they believe in the rapture no idea no idea <laughs> you know there's you could be agnostic about certain aspects of Christianity and not quite convinced that you know this part of Christianity is true or that part of Christianity is true and still overall sympathetic to the idea of it or to God belief in general and recognize its usefulness and it's like you know have kind of have the idea of God pulling on your heartstrings without without becoming a fundamentalist Christian. It's not a gateway drug religion. It's really not. You, you know, think of it this way. God puts God is available in your life to the exact degree that you want it to be. And if you don't believe in God, spirituality is available in your life to the exact degree that you want it to be. It's a choice. And it's a choice that you can constantly like adjust you don't have to sign off on the metaphysical claims of religion to recognize its pull on your heart and on your approach to life that's what I think a lot of what Nathan's uh, if you watch if you read Nathan's article about why he's choosing to become a Christian again to some degree if he's a Christian again I, I guess he's how he labeled himself that's what I thought he meant and I thought that there was a lot of intelligence in that I thought there was a, that was a wise take a smart take and I think that's an organic and natural take for most people. You become sort of a, a, a Joe Schmidt type philosophical agnostic who, or John Verveke who's very interested in spirituality and somewhat sympathetic to it. You know, that's I see the natural organic process of deconstruction or deconversion. But anyways, that is all for now. As far as the Matt Dillahunty story goes, we'll see how it ends. I mean, the big part of what makes him popular is dunking on Christianity. That's, that's the show, Atheist Experience. So that's the conflict right at the heart of it. They hired Shannon because they were trying to move off brand, and maybe it was Matt Dillahunty himself who got Shannon there. Jenna Belk, same idea, off brand. Jenna Belk is very Shannon-esque, totally different type of brand. But the type of brand that Shannon represents, the type of brand that philosophical atheists represent, and spiritual agnostics, same idea, that brand has staying power. So if you're an atheist, be like the philosophical atheist. Get on their page. Promote their work. Promote their way of being. 
they should be the leaders. Why? Because they're, they're, they're the ones who are going to, you know, ultimately I see this go and breaking their way all together in the long run anyways. Best case scenario for them. That's how I see this going. But, you know, as Philip Mueller said, I, he thinks I'm too optimistic. I don't see it going any other way. I don't see a long shelf life left for Debate Me Bro. I really don't. I really don't. I don't see it lasting. And some of that, some of the rumblings against it are coming from within the atheist community itself. Which means its days are kind of numbered. That's how I see it, you know. Matt Delahunty was the king of that approach. And he's the only one who could have done that approach without being a figure of, of, that was genuinely reviled. So, outside of Matt Dillahunty, the people who generally approach that way are reviled. <laughs> people hate them. <laughs> people hate them. So, there you go. You don't really want that to be the, the look for atheism. It's not ready for prime time. It's not what you want people seeing. When they see a show that's popular, you want them to see Shannon. Shannon and Answers from Reason. Oh, that's atheists are intelligent. <laughs> they have intelligent conversations. There's Shannon and Bearded Eric. You know, these are they're intelligent, reasonable human beings who have intelligent conversations. That's what you want. No matter how popular that gets, that's much better. That's much, you, much serves you, the atheist, much better. Why? It's a better look. People watch that and they'll be like, okay, atheists are smart, atheists are civilized. That's really honestly what you want if you're an atheist. That's how I see it, guys. I, I, I see the wisdom in what I just said, so I'll let you decide that for yourself. Again, I'm not, not a leader in the atheist community. I just, you know, give my two cents, make my videos. So there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Be interesting to watch, see how it all transpires. I will be keeping a close eye as per the usual. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.